Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's One Ocean Hub webinar for the United Nation Nippon Fellows and Alumni. We have a really great uh, selection of speakers for you today, uh, so I look forward to getting started. My name is Murray Roberts. I'm a professor of applied marine biology and ecology at the University of Edinburgh. I'm also a partner in the One Ocean Hub, so it's a great honor to moderate today's webinar. And we have a wonderful selection of speakers who I'll be introducing to you soon, uh, covering the major aspects of uh, ocean and climate change, both from the perspectives of impact and importantly, adaptation. Now, today's webinar is gonna be recorded, so it will be available afterwards. Um, and we will run the webinar through a series of talks that will last 15 minutes, followed by five minutes for your questions. So please, if you have questions as a speaker is talking, could you use the question and answer box in the webinar to send your question in? And then after each talk, we'll take your questions. Please also feel free to introduce yourselves using the chat function in the webinar. It's really nice to do that actually. If you don't know each other so well, it's a great chance to connect and also to introduce yourself uh, to, back to old friends again. So do use the chat function during the webinar. At the end of the talks, um, Mr. Siri, uh, the secretary from the Secretary Directorate General of Mar Marine Spatial Planning and Management at the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries will make an intervention. So we look forward to uh, Mr. Siri's intervention right at the end of the talks and we'll make sure that we leave time for that. Okay, without any further ado, let me please introduce our first speaker uh, who will talk about uh, uh, deep sea uh, ecosystems and climate change. Our first speaker is Professor Andrew Sweetman from the Lyle Center at Heriot Watts University in Edinburgh. Andrew did his PhD at the Max Planck Institute in Germany before postdoctoral work, including Woods Hole, Woods Hole Oceanographic, Florida State University, University of Maine, and then over to the University of Hawaii before he landed for a while in Bergen and relocated over to where actually we're both sitting. I'm in Edinburgh, Andrew is also in Edinburgh uh, to work at uh, the Lyle Center. Andrew's expert in seafloor biodiversity and ecology and takes a really strong interest in climate change and anthropogenic impacts. So without further ado, Andrew, I will pass the microphone to you and allow you to get your slides up on the screen. Maria, is it possible for you to see my screen? We see your screen and we hear you well. Excellent, great. Okay, well, um, lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, welcome to everyone who's attending uh, online from all over the world. So as Murray uh, said, uh, my name is Andrew Sweetman and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the impacts of climate change on deep ocean ecosystems. And when I'm talking about deep ocean ecosystems, I'm talking about the part of the ocean below a depth of 200 meters all the way down to almost 11,000 meters or almost seven and a half miles depth. So let's see if this works. Okay, so we know that uh, fossil fuel emissions are continuing as a result of um, burning of fossil fuels. We're also enhancing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere through deforestation and, and the removal of other CO2 sequestering habitat, and also with cement production. For example, lime kil kilns produce uh, significant amounts of CO2 as well. So as we um, build new cities and use more and more cements, we're increasing atmospheric CO2 levels quite significantly. And today the uh, atmospheric CO2 level was around 411 parts per million. Uh, just to give you an idea where it is in this in this curve. What the CO2 is doing um, is it's causing what's called the greenhouse effect. So the, the atmosphere and the earth are warming up and what's happening is that the upper ocean is taking up an enormous amount of heat as you can see on this graph on the left. These are the, this is the um, heat content in joules over time. Also as the CO2 is diffusing into the upper ocean. It's combining with water 
forming carbonic acid, which is then driving down the pH in a process that we call ocean acidification. And what happens at the upper ocean affects the deep sea, because in certain parts of the world, you get what's called deep water formation. In parts around um, the Labrador Sea in the North Atlantic and the Weddell Sea in the, in the Southern Ocean, the ocean here at the surface is so cold, it's dense, it starts to sink down into the deep sea and it starts flowing through the major ocean basins into the Indian Ocean, into the Pacific Ocean, providing oxygen for animals and microbes living in the water column and at the seafloor. And eventually over time, it will upwell and begin its transition back to the, to the uh, North Atlantic where it will again cool and sink. So under a warmer climate, this water which is sinking down will eventually take, because it will be warmer, it will be taking warmer water to the deep sea. Also, some of this water will be relatively oxygen poor and CO2 rich. So through this process, what's happening is that the deep sea is becoming warmer, it's becoming less oxic, and the pH of deep sea waters is decreasing. It's becoming more acidic. And just to give you an idea about how much the deep sea has warmed um, in the past, if you look into some of the paleo records, you can see that the deep sea has probably warmed up about a degree in places, a degree or changed in terms of temperature by a degree over a period around five to six million years. Okay, so that just gives you an idea about the, the natural variability. In other areas, it's, it's, it's um, greater changes. In, uh, in other areas, the, the changes are less. Warmer surface oceans also affect primary production in the upper ocean. If you were to send down a profiler, which measures temperature through the water column down to the deep sea, you would see that the temperature of the water would follow something similar to what this red line shows. And what you see is this sudden abrupt change at around 500 meters depth. Sometimes it's shallower, sometimes it's deeper. This is called the thermocline. And this thermocline limits nutrients which are produced in the deep ocean from being mixed up into the upper ocean, which are then used by phytoplankton, marine algae, to photosynthesize, produce biomass. So what is happening is as the sea surface temperature is warming and this thermocline is becoming stronger, net primary production in certain parts of the ocean is changing, it's decreasing. Also, the size classes of the algal communities are changing. As temperature warms and nutrients become much uh, more limited, what happens is the algae become smaller. So the, the contribution of very small algae, what we call picophytoplankton, actually increases. They become smaller because they, by becoming smaller, they essentially can increase their surface area to volume ratio, which allows them to be um, able to uh, compete for nutrients um, in a more nutrient limited environment. But the smaller algae weigh less, so they sink slower. In the deep ocean for, most part, for the most part, it's the phytoplankton growing in the surface ocean that provides the food for the deep sea. After a phytoplankton bloom, once the phytoplankton have used up all the nutrients, they die and start sinking as what, we, as what is called particulate organic carbon or phytodetritus to the seafloor. And this is the food that drives most of the deep sea floor with the exception of certain chemosynthetic ecosystems in the water column and at hydrothermal vents, for example. And what you can see is if you look at the um, deep sea ecosystem characteristics, so the biomass of the animals, the biomass of the microbes, the biomass of the nematodes, these tiny little myofauna, and what we call SCOC, which is essentially seafloor respiration, everything positively covaries with POC flux. So if there's more primary production going on in the upper ocean, there's more animal biomass, there's more um, microbial biomass, there's more seafloor respiration, generally the ecosystem is healthier. And just to give you an idea about how little food naturally these organisms um, get, the amount of carbon that one square meter of seafloor at 4,000 meters depth 
receives in a single year is equivalent to the amount of carbon in a single sugar cube. That is all the carbon that the animals at 4,000 meters depth receive in a single year per square meter. That just is to put it in perspective. These are very, very food limited environments, but they're very stable environments as well. So what we've been doing over the last couple of years with people like Murray, um, others in the US and various other places is we've been modeling how um, CO2 emissions to the atmosphere may increase and um, what this will do to deep sea temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH and seafloor food supply. And what you can see in most areas of the deep sea, there is gonna be a positive increase in temperature in some places up to four and a half degrees in 80 years, relative to a one degree change in five to 6 million years. Also, there's gonna be a lot of, um, sorry, also there's gonna be uh, declines in oxygen, water column pH, and also a decline in seafloor POC flux. And just to put this in perspective, this is where we think that temperature, oxygen, pH, and seafloor food supply will change. And you can see that the North Atlantic is um, in for a particularly rough ride. It's gonna be a lot warmer, there's gonna be less oxygen, it's gonna be more acidic. And for most of the deep sea, because of this warmer upper ocean, there's gonna be less food supply to the seafloor. And you can see here that in some places, you're talking almost a 30% loss in food availability to the seafloor. So this sugar cube is gonna be divided into half essentially. And with a decline in POC flux and food supply, we're likely to see a decline in biomass, abundance, uh, respiration, microbial biomass. All of these things are likely to decrease due to a decline in food supply. And just to put it in perspective, we're envisaging if we keep on doing what we're doing, there could be 5.2 billion kilos of living biomass that's being lost by 2100 from the seafloor. This doesn't include the animals living in the water column. And to put it in perspective even more, the weight of the human population is approximately 43 billion kilos. So deep sea floor biomass loss is equivalent to losing about 12% of the humans from Europe or 72 million people, which is quite a lot. If we go look at the poles, some of the um, areas around Antarctica, for example, the Western Antarctic Peninsula are experiencing very, very rapid warming. There are certain places in the Arctic that are also warming very, very rapidly, but along the Western Antarctic Peninsula, it's warming extremely rapidly. Here in the summertime, when the ice breaks up because, um, because of the warmer temperatures, it leads to high um, levels of ocean productivity in the upper ocean. And this leads to high fluxes of food to the seafloor. And you can see what these flux, these, this food supply to the seafloor looks like in these images over on the right-hand side, you can see the greenish tinge to the seafloor and a greenish layer in the top of the sediment core. This is phytodetritus. This is the food. This is that one gram of carbon that is sinking down to the seafloor each year. Organic matter food concentrations, they build up uh, due to the low temperatures in the Antarctic and they persist for a long period of time because of these low, low temperatures. And this leads to what's called a food bank in deep sea sediments, which the animals use to feed during the polar winter when there's very, very little primary production going up in the, on in the upper ocean because of the sea, life, sea ice formation. So this food bank that builds up provides food during the long polar, or, um, polar autumn and winter. Warming of Antarctic shelf bottom waters, however, by a few degrees could enhance the efficiency of microbial remineralization. Remember, as things get hotter, processes, biological processes increase because they're enzymatically driven for the most part. And this will decrease background levels of food in the sediments, which will have an impact on the animals living at the seafloor that are using this food to, to feed on. And this can alter food webs and reducing the fate of carbon sequestration in Antarctic sediments. 
There can also be ice shelf collapse. We've all seen images of this from the media. And one of the things that um, is common to um, sea ice and uh, ice shelves is that you tend to have very, very low amounts of primary production under the ice shelf. Further offshore, however, over deep water, you have this breakup of the ice. The algae there can get, gain access to uh, light much more efficiently. There's nutrients being released from the sea ice as it's melting. So these algae produce organic material that can sink down to the seafloor and feed the seafloor in deep sea environments. Following the collapse of an ice shelf, however, there will be a shift to um, shore of this major productivity regime and the amount of carbon coming down into the deep sea is likely to become less. There will also be iceberg scouring. Think of a humongous iceberg scraping itself along the seafloor and if there's any animals in the way, corals, sponges, they're gonna be crushed. There will also be higher levels of organic matter to areas that in the pre-collapse uh, era um, wouldn't have been receiving that much carbon, but now they're receiving a lot of food. The sediments may become organically enriched and this can have toxic effects on the animals. There will also be climate change impacts on deep sea corals. Deep sea corals are for the most part a biodiversity hotspot. They're found right around the world, in particular around Scandinavia and Northwest Scotland, um, places like Iceland. They're very, very rich in terms of biodiversity. However, with increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere diffusing into the water, this will lead to what's called a shallowing of the aragonite saturation horizon. Where the aragonite saturation horizon becomes shallower, below the horizon, it will become, it, it's too acidic for the corals to um, stop uh, a dissolution. They can still potentially calcify, but um, dissolution of the calcium carbonate shells of the corals um, becomes uh, more problematic. And what you tend to find as you decrease the aragonite saturation and the corals start living in more um, acidic waters, very often on uh, live corals actually live on dead corals. And while the live corals are still able to calcify, the dead corals aren't able to calcify. And what you get is what's called coral porosis, where you can see that the coral, the dead coral living underneath the living coral starts to develop cracks. It becomes weaker. And as the live coral grows and grows and grows, eventually it will become too heavy and it will um, basically uh, crumble away because the, the dead coral beneath it um, has, has uh, developed uh, coral porosis. And that will uh, have significant impacts on deep sea corals. And you can see that in this graph as the aragonite, or this image as the aragonite saturation moves shallower um, due to ocean acidification, you start to lose the uh, dead coral. Um, and this also provides habitat for animals living uh, in it. It will reduce the habitat heterogeneity. And if you reduce the habitat heterogeneity, you reduce all these nooks and crannies for little animals to live in. So you reduce biodiversity. And at the same time, as all of these climate change impacts are going on, there will be deep sea mining potentially going on to produce the raw um, minerals for, for example, high tech industries. There'll, there'll be oil and gas moving to deeper water environments. There'll be increased litter um, being dumped into the deep ocean. There'll be more fishing going on in the open ocean. So the deep sea is really very possibly in for a rough ride over the next uh, couple of years. So it's absolutely critical now that we identify where these hotspots of climate change are gonna occur in the deep sea. And a couple of, um, in 2019, um, Elisa Levin and others, including myself, met up at Scripps Institution of Oceanography to see where climate change impacts would be greatest in areas where deep sea mining was gonna take place. And what you can see in this bottom part of the image here is that in certain parts of the um, Southern Clarion Clipperton zone, 
where they're going to be mining polymetallic nodules, there's going to be significant climate change impacts going on at the same time that mining is going to be going on. Whereas in other areas, the climate change impacts are going to be less. So if we're going to mine the deep sea, maybe we want to be doing it in places where the climate change impacts are going to be less. So we need new initiatives focusing on assessing the effects of um, climate change and other anthropogenic stresses in the deep sea. And we also need significant amounts of funding being directed into this uh, arena to assess the effects and potentially identify the areas where animals and communities and ecosystems will be uh, um, less or more susceptible to climate change impacts and adverse effects from other anthropogenic stresses. So with that, um, and these two projects that I'm involved in are actually um, focusing partly on answering some of these effect, um, some of these uh, questions. The I Atlantic project is an EC project coordinated by the University of Edinburgh and the One Ocean Hub is also, um, is funded through UKRI and uh, the GCRF program. And in both those projects, we'll be looking at identifying the effects and trying to identify refugia for deep sea ecosystems. And with that, I'll just uh, say thank you. And um, I hope that made sense. <laughs> Andrew, thank you very much. That was fantastic. And Andrew has given us a really amazing insight there into the rates and the significance of climate change at the, the big scale across the entire global ocean. And our next talk will take us into coastal environments. But before we go there, I wanna give people the chance to ask any questions that you may have. There are no questions currently in the Q&A box, so don't be shy. Please, if you have a question, do put it into the Q&A box and I can pull that out. I'll just check the chat to see if there are questions coming through there. I'll use a little bit of the time, Andrew, maybe to pose uh, a kind of question or comment um, that you might get after such a talk. Some, some people may come back at you and say, well, okay, Andrew, this, this is very interesting and you're talking about this potential loss of, of uh, all this biomass and, and then the, the, these effects um, impacting upon the deep ocean, but it'll just bounce back, right? So could you say something about the likely rates of recovery? Um, well, yes, uh, it, it, it varies in different deep sea environments. For example, there are some hydrothermal vents for example, in the East Pacific that can bounce back from major disturbance in as little as five years. Other um, types of ecosystems will take um, decades to centuries, sometimes even millennia for, for um, um, uh, following disturbance. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that what the deep sea is such a state, generally a stable environment. In terms of the temperature in some places, as I said, the temperature has changed one degree within four, five to six million years. The organisms, the ecosystems found in these environments are not, haven't evolved to deal with sudden environmental change and they haven't evolved the ability to rapidly bounce back, to rapidly recover. Um, so once you start losing the biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services as a result of climate change or whatever, um, deep sea fishing, oil and gas extraction, deep sea mining, it can take the deep sea and its um, ecosystems uh, an enormous amount of time to bounce back. A lot, a lot, uh, it will take a, generally a lot uh, longer than a shallow water environment, for example. And some of these organisms, for example, there's some deep sea corals, which I think are between two to 3000 years old. And when we lose those, in order for them to come back, you're going to have to wait two to 3,000 years if, if they're ever able to come back. Yes, Andrew, thank you very much. There's a, a comment in uh, to the chat from Teresa Fernandez. Um, the message seems to be gloomy. There may be uh, bounce back, some, but it will depend on the pressures reducing. There will also be a lag in any case, which I think, Andrew, you, you, you have commented on. But would you like to pick in anything up on that particular point? Um, well, yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if you take away all the pressures, climate change pressure, anthro other anthropogenic impacts, resource extraction, yes, these, these, these organisms will um, eventually bounce back after a long period of time. But the way that things are going uh, in terms of us exploiting 
you know, the natural environment and producing or um, uh, not changing our ways uh, at the level or at the speed that we need to, um, I, I think the deep sea is going to be in for a very rough, rough ride. And, and the important thing is that the deep sea is vital to human health. So all, a lot of the nutrients that are produced in the uh, Eastern Pacific, for example, in the deep ocean, they're produced in the deep ocean. And these nutrients eventually upwell along the west coast of the Americas. And when they do, they provide a lot of productivity. Um, they provide a lot of food for zooplankton, which provides food for fishes, which then local communities can, can, um, can exploit and uh, you know, make a living from. Eventually, um, if we harm the deep sea, those, those types of uh, ecosystems, those shallow ocean ecosystems will also be affected in time. It will take uh, hundreds of years for that to happen, but uh, you know it's um it's something that we need to think about. Wonderful, Andrew. Thank you so much. So we're now going to move from our first speaker to our second, and I'll introduce Merle Soman, uh, who will talk about on the vulnerability of coastal communities to climate change. Now, Merle is associate professor and head of the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So wonderful to have uh, Merle with us today. Uh, she obtained her PhD uh, from the University of Cape Town uh, in 1994, is involved in research, consulting and teaching in the fields of environmental governance, with a particular focus on integrated coastal and fisheries governance since the mid 1990s. So Merle, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. I can see your slides up on the screen. If you could take us into slideshow mode, uh, the floor is yours. How's that? That looks perfect. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. So we're moving into the coastal environment, and um, I'm going to be talking about vulnerability assessment to support adaptation planning in coastal communities in the context of climate change. And particularly, I'm going to be sharing some insights from work that I've been involved in in the Benguela current large marine ecosystem um, on exploring vulnerability of coastal communities and some of their adaptation strategies. And I'd just like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Serge Ramikas from the Abalobi NPO, who has done a lot of this work with me. Right, so we know that millions of people are, live adjacent to the coastal environment, and they depend on marine resources and coastal resources for food and livelihoods. And many of these are particularly vulnerable to the risks associated with climate change. I mean, we're all aware of the increased frequency and severity um, of these extreme weather events. But as well, we need to be mindful of slow onset changes, things like climate change, sea level rise, changes in temperature and rainfall, wind and ocean currents, as well as the shifts um, in the distribution and abundance of species are having a big effect on the livelihoods of coastal communities and particularly poor and marginalized people. So not only are vulnerable um, communities locate vulnerable because of their geographic location, but they're also vulnerable because of their weak socioeconomic circumstances. They depend on fish for food and livelihoods. And very often these communities have low capacity to adapt to shocks and stresses. So we're dealing with very marginalized communities already. And now we have this added stressor of climate variability and change. So understanding the vulnerability of communities at risk is necessary for us to develop appropriate and locally appropriate adapt adaptation strategies and build community resilience. So what I want to talk to, to you about today is, is, is why we need to do community level vulnerability assessments and why we need to involve local communities in this process of understanding vulnerability and and um, planning for um, climate change. We know climate change is a global phenomenon, but actually its effects are felt at the local level. And these increased risks and uncertainties challenge local, people, local people's livelihoods. And of course, this obstructs development. So understanding vulnerability at this local level is necessary for us to embark on effective adaptation planning. And one of the great values of working at this local level with local communities is 
being able to incorporate their local knowledge, their local understanding and observations of the changes that they are seeing. And this, of course, enhances our ability to, um, to plan. So one of the main reasons we, we, we need to do this vulnerability assessment at the local level is to help improve the targeting of the adaptation strategies and overall um, their effectiveness. So as I said, we've been working in the countries Angola, Namibia and South Africa, specifically looking at vulnerability um, of coastal communities to climate change. And over the last five years, we've developed uh, what we've called a rapid vulnerability assessment tool, um, which is really to try and explore community vulnerability, uh, very much from their perspective and experience, and then to explore with them possible adaptation strategies and look at ways of building adaptive capacity. So some of the features of community level vulnerability assessments is that it enables us to hear the voices of local people based on their experience, their day-to-day -day experience, their fishing practices, how they're dealing with local farming and so forth. We can hear about the threats and stresses that they face, draw on their experiences, um, understand how they perceive change, what the possible causes are, and how they're coping and adapting and what they deem to be appropriate and feasible adaptation strategies. So this work has been undertaken in the Benguela current large marine ecosystem. And it's been taken over the, we've been doing this over the last four to five years. And we've now completed 15 community vulnerability assessments in the communities. In fact, they're not all um, highlighted in this, in this map, um, of, as I said, um, over the last four to five years. This work has been undertaken with local partners, with NGOs, working with fish, fishery co-ops, and the main focus has been to work at the local level with local people drawing on their local knowledge, observations, and perceptions. So the workshop process that we have engaged in takes place over a two-day period, and we take people through a series of exercises. And unfortunately, there's not enough time to go into the detail of exactly how this plays out. But essentially, it's a two-day process with the option of a third day to conduct some focus groups, and um, we start off by basically getting, we might have say 20 to 25 people in the room at, at the time, getting people to basically map their context. So we call this village mapping and people will then map what basically what, what, um, what fisheries they're involved in, what activities they're engaged in, what they value in the environment. And um, just to give a sense of, of and get to know um, the nature of, of, of their context. The next stage, we move on to identifying stresses and threats. And we look at these both in terms of the threats from an environmental perspective, so the kind of climate change threats, but also socioeconomic and governance threats, as these are obviously very intertwined. And as I've mentioned, very often it's the, the climate change stresses that are exacerbating their vulnerability context. Another key activity is to, is, to get community, to, is to get the participants to talk through and identify the kind of key climate events or key environmental changes that they have noted over a period of time. So things like you know, major red tide events or massive storms and even changes in wind directions, which they've noted, which might impact um, on particular um, fishing patterns that they have been accustomed to and which now require um, shifts in behavior. We also get um, the participants to identify the impacts associated with the stresses and then to explore what they believe the reasons are for these changes. We then move on to looking at coping mechanisms. And here I'm just giving you some feedback from one particular uh, workshop we ran in a place in South Africa called Sintelina Bay, where basically fishers said, you know, after we had those radical five days of red tide, we ate anything. Seabirds, we would perch in their protected area, we sold our boats. Um, and obviously people realized that beginning to organize was one way of trying to share information and perhaps getting more organized to manage the situation. But what we know about these kind of approaches is that they're short term, they're survivalist, and they certainly are not going to provide a sustainable solution. And so we then explore with communities what strategies they believe could work 
either are working or could work in terms of responding to and addressing the kind of stresses that they perceive or experience as a result of climate change. And this table just gives you in very broad terms some of the kinds of strategies that um, communities have identified from local level organization um, through to the need for better safety at sea mechanisms and early warning systems to um, exploring alternative and supplementary livelihoods. And of course, some of these strategies might be things that can be done immediately, like getting organized or perhaps some skills training. But others, for example, exploring alternative livelihoods would be much longer term um, interventions, because that obviously needs possibly some research, some experimentation, some pilot testing before one could actually um, embark on that um, and execute that particular strategy. So if I just draw on some of the findings from our work in the Benguela current region, um, some of the common stresses facing coastal fishing communities in this area, if we look at the ecological stresses that were listed, I've kind of summarized these from our 15 workshops. We see a, you know, a lot of the same things were coming up. Um, you know, the unpredictability was a huge issue for people, the inability to plan trips you know, they were used to northwester winds blowing and bringing, for example, a snook run. And now they'd go out when the northwester blew, get out to sea, and then suddenly it changes to a southwester, and they've wasted all that petrol money and time and a crew, and they have no catch. So the unpredictable nature is something that they're grappling with. Changes in species distribution, the fact that very often they need to travel much further out to find um, resources, of course, has got all sorts of implications and socioeconomic implications, rougher sea conditions in some areas, meaning less days at sea with, with various um, economic impacts um, and so forth. And I won't go through all of them. But I think what's important in looking at this table or in these columns is to see, is to realize that the socioeconomic and the governance or management stresses are already there. So people are living in situations of poverty, poor infrastructure, you know, gender and substance abuse. They have poor communication channels with government. There's limited participation in making rules, for example. And now we have this added set of stresses that communities are having to grapple with. I think one of the interesting things that came out of this, um, this work has been the richness of information that one can, one can get from local communities based on their observations. Obviously, they're the ones going to see every day. And so they have an enormous amount of understanding of the changes that are, are, are currently taking place. Of course, matching these two knowledges is not that easy because available science is conducted at different temporal and spatial scales. And local uh, fishing uh, fisher people are based on a, a particular area, an embayment or an estuary. But what was interesting is the incredible correlation across these two different knowledge systems. And I think what was most interesting is, is when you realize how this local fisher knowledge can provide, in some instances, an early indication of change and can actually suggest areas of research inquiry to scientists. They can even help guide the questions. Um, um, in the analysis of data. So bringing these two knowledges or these two groups of scientists and fishers together in getting a better understanding of change and the impacts of change can be a very valuable um, exercise. So there were a range of adaptation options and strategies identified by people, and I'm not going to go into all of them. I think you can just cast your eye over that. But from, you know, sort of organizational issues around being more organized to diversification of livelihoods, skills training, through to looking at ways of product benefic beneficiation and value adding so that at least, you know, there's not so much wastage and people can get their products to market at a good price. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of ideas that people had for dealing with um, the impacts of climate change. So if we, if we take these vulnerability assessments, um, you know, what's important about them is that it gives us this information from the bottom up and, 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 and tells us about the realities that people are facing on the ground, providing us ideas about adaptation strategies that hopefully are workable, 
but that are supported, they're legitimate. And so rather than the kind of top-down government intervention about, um, uh, you know, people are struggling with some, you know, flooding or species are further out, we better do X and Y. Here we're actually working with communities to look at realistic and feasible alternatives or realistic and feasible strategies to deal with their situation. What was also interesting is a lot of um, participants in these workshops said they found it such an empowering process to, to really be sharing this information and realizing um, you know, that they could contribute to this process, but also um, just kind of putting, you know, putting all these um, different things together um, in these kind of two-day workshops enabled them to make the linkages between the kind of day-to-day -day challenges they're facing and their kind of socioeconomic circumstances. So when we move from the vulnerability assessment and the strategies that have been identified by local fishing communities, we now need to move into the adaptation planning process, which is also an ongoing, iterative, that's a longer term ongoing iterative process, which can be done by holding workshops, um, by having small group meetings. Um, but, you know, this isn't just a once off thing. This requires, um, obviously, some things need to be followed up. One needs to possibly do some research. For example, communities might say things like, you know, we see the potential for mariculture in this area or for seaweed harvesting. Well, then one has to go and look at the actual feasibility of doing that. Or in the case of seaweed harvesting, the issues of getting licenses, the issues of sustainable harvesting. So one might have to engage with a particular fisheries or um, environmental government agency to pursue that. And so the facilitator would have to bring, or the scientists would bring information back to communities. And so over time, one would then work with communities and government to develop these um, adaptation plans. So it's a, it's a slow process. It needs to be iterative. And one needs to realize that priorities change. Um, and so um, obviously, this is an adaptive um, exercise. I think what's critically important when we're thinking about working at the community level is, is how do we ensure that the information, the knowledge, the ideas, the plans generated at a local community level gets integrated into other sector and national adaptation planning processes and um, uh, climate change plans. So, you know, it's not helpful to just leave these plans at the local level and expect the local government to respond to them. It's about actively inserting this information at the local level and at the national level into the appropriate plans and strategic initiatives. So in conclusion then, um, yeah, I suppose, I just need to iterate that local communities, because of their geographic location, because of a variety of circumstances, are particularly vulnerable to climate change. And that community vulnerability assessment tools are useful because they help us gather community knowledge and perceptions based on their lived reality, their day-to-day -day experience, which can inform local adaptation plans. It is also useful um, process to um, enhance understanding amongst the Fisher community and other stakeholders through this social learning process. And of course, it, it provides an opportunity to bring different knowledges together. So what community-based adaptation planning does is it identifies ad uh, actions and strategies that are workable, that are hopefully feasible, and that are most importantly seen as legitimate at the local level. But we need to recognize these are ongoing iterative processes and adaptive. And key then is integration of this local level work, ideas, plans, concerns into um, other sector uh, plans and uh, national plans. So thanks very much. Verla, thank you so much for that really, really interesting talk and for bringing people right up and center in, in our thinking. I very much enjoyed the, the focus you gave to local and indigenous knowledge and how important that's been uh, in your work. We have time for just one question, I'm afraid, but there is a question from Pedro Garcia. Have you ever attempted a workshop at introducing these processes to grassroots, small-scale fisheries organizations? Well, I mean, these are exactly the people we're working with when we're gathering this information. This is these processes, this workshop is working with fisher folk on the ground. So we are working with fishermen, fisherwomen, 
in a workshop setting um, using the kinds of um, tools that I sort of ran through quite quickly. So that is precisely who we're targeting. Wonderful, thank you. And I think the point you made also was very telling where the feedback is so strong that the unpredictability of weather patterns is a major, major issue. And of course, that's something that is forecast to only get uh, worse so sadly in the future as climate change um, worsens. So Merla, thank you very much. Uh, I will move now to our third speaker and a great pleasure to welcome Emmanuel Aschenbong, uh, who is going to speak to us today on the evolution of pelagic fisheries under climate change. Emmanuel is joining us today from Hamburg in Germany, um, where he studied his, for his PhD. Uh, he was a senior research fellow for five years there from August uh, 2007 until December 2012 at the Center for Earth System Research and Sustainability. But his postdoctoral work uh, has been with two international European projects. Uh, some of you may know these, the MIS Marine Ecosystem Evolution and a Changing Ocean Program and also Eurobasin, a pelagic um, uh, research program crossing the Atlantic. Currently, uh, Emmanuel is lecturer at the Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences, University of the Cape Coast in Ghana. So thank you very much, Emmanuel, for joining us. It's lovely to have you. Again, to the audience, please don't be shy about putting your questions up uh, as soon as they come, and we'll get those to Emmanuel. But Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Robert, for the introduction. And uh, colleagues and participants, hello, good afternoon. Good morning, good evening, and thank you very much for making time to join our seminar today. I, I work with the University of Cape Coast, as uh, Professor Murray said, with the Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences, but I do carry out my community engagement assignment with the university's uh, Center of Excellence on Coastal Resilience. So there I do community engagement on climate change adaptation issues. Uh, my, my expertise is mainly in, is, is in biological oceanography. So I'm going to discuss the evolution of pelagic marine fisheries from the perspective of, of or from an ecological perspective, looking at how changes in key environmental variables are likely to impact on the distribution and the abundance of exploited fish species. As uh, the earlier speaker, uh, speakers made you aware, especially from Professor uh, Sweetman, uh, we, we got to understand that climate change is a very complex phenomenon that is impacting our oceans through various variables. So it's not, the ocean is not only warming, but it's also getting acidic. And the interaction between these two uh, factors are impacting the biochemistry of the ocean with consequences at both the cellular level of organisms as well as at the population level of organisms. So the hydrography of the ocean, for example, is changing and it is impacting the transport of fish larvae, fish eggs, and even the growth of fish. So when we talk about fish, what are you talking about? A pelagic fish, a fish that lives only in the water column, or a fish that prefers the bottom of the ocean. Almost all the different stages of development are impacted by climate change. I am not going to uh, spend time to discuss how these different factors are impacting the productivity of the pelagic ocean, uh, ocean oceanic pelagic fisheries. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to just take you to look at how we get fish from the ocean. The, the basic stock assessment model is that any biomass that you get from the fish is derived from the net between growth processes and mortality processes. So here I am, I am excluding deliberately fishing mortality. So the mortality I'm talking about here are the, is the natural mortality. And the growth processes, as you are all aware, are derived from the ability of fish to produce enough eggs 
for the eggs to develop and hatch into larvae, for the larvae to grow and survive and be recruited into the fishery. And you agree with me that all these different processes are impacted by the changes in the environment. So it will be complex and it will eat a lot of time for, for me to dwell on each of these processes. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to focus my discussion on two key environmental factors that are impacting or that are likely to impact heavily on the production of our pelagic fisheries. And the first is on sea surface warming. And as the earlier speaker made us aware, the surface of the ocean is warming. And in the nearest future, the next 20 years, 20, 30 years from now, we are expecting to have on av average on the global level about one degree Celsius increase in sea surface temperature. And that is likely to impact heavily on many biological processes, including primary production and availability of food to power the growth of fish stocks. So this is what I, I'm going to use for, for my discussion. I'm not going to discuss the impact due to ocean acidification. I, I, pardon me for that, but you all agree that when the ocean gets acidic, many biological processes, including the forming of shells by shell fishes will, will be interrupted or will be disturbed and it will not progress as planned. Uh, for the purpose of time, I'm going to limit my discussion only to fin fishes. So when we look at the effect of warming, the general model is that for growth, egg production, larva development, survival, every species of fish or every population of fish has its preferred range of temperatures for optimum production. Okay. Once this optimum temperature is reached and exceeded, then the, the fitness of that fish will, will go down drastically. For, for mortality, you will expect that to increase with temperature and then become maximum, almost 100% when temperature exceeds the adaptive capacity of the species in, in, question, in question. So this is generally how you will expect changes in the global, uh, in the sea surface temperatures to affect the fitness of different fish species. And we know that different species of fish that are adapted to different parts of the world have different limits, different temperature environments that they can tolerate. And as you go closer to, to the margins of our planet, to the higher latitude, okay, this the window of tolerance or the, the thermal habitat becomes narrower. And the same applies at the equator, where organisms have very limited ability to deal with changes in the temperature conditions of the environment. And almost all the different life stages of each fish stock or each population of fish is impacted by the changes in temperature conditions. So we know from laboratory investigations as well as from modeling investigations that when the surface of the sea ocean is warmed, even by about 0.5 degrees Celsius, the fitness of different fish species, whether you're talking about shellfish or fin fish, whoa, decreases significantly. These are known facts observed in the laboratory and also predicted by many modeling investigations. So the warming of the ocean is not likely to be very good for the growth of many fish. There's, there's a complexity to this that I, I, I have deliberately avoided because that will prolong the discussion. But our work 
in the Gulf of Guinea region, looking at small pelagic fish species that constitute a bulk of the catches harvested by our artisanal fishermen, indicate that even for species that are related, here, the example I'm using here is uh, the sardines, the small sardines. They, they, they are response to changes in sea surface temperature are not likely to, to be the same. So see here in the, the graph you see on, on the screen, the bottom part is uh, around sardine. And you will see that warming sort of becomes beneficial to the fish to a point, to about 0.2 degrees Celsius above the average sea surface temperature of the Gulf of Guinea region. And then it falls, it falls off. And we cannot say the same for the, the flat sardine, the sardinella madrensis. So, so here, it shows that even though almost all species are likely to suffer as a result of the warming of our environments, the response will, will not be the same for the different species. What about availability of prey items? You know, here we're talking about simple food chain processes where nutrient is absorbed by phytoplankton that produces biomass that gets ingested by zooplankton and then the energy transferred up the food chain. And observations from different regions of the world indicate that the warming of the ocean is likely to limit primary production of the ocean. And this is similar to the picture that uh, the first speaker showed us. And here, the information I'm showing here is from the Benguela Apollon. And this observation, this is not a prediction. This is an observation okay, between 2002 and 2007. And if you see how the changes in growth rate concentration which is normally used as proxy for primary production relates to the warming of the sea surface. You, you can agree with me that when the sea is colder or relatively cold, there tends to be a lot more primary, primary production going on than when it is warmer. So then we can agree that the availability, the, the bulk amount of food that becomes available for the growth of uh, secondary consumers will be limited. And what we've also seen in our research work, looking at the phytoplankton production within the Gulf of Guinea region, is that the, the biochemical structure, as well as the energy content of the key phytoplankton organisms that are fed on by zooplankton is also likely to, to change. And the response is also going to be different for the different groups of the primary producers that we find, we find in our oceans. So here, you see that for, for, for the diatoms on, on the top graph, warming tend to be a bit advantageous. Plus, four, plus two degrees Celsius warming, the biomass of the cell goes up. And even when the warming passes, as we normally observe during marine heat wave conditions, uh, situations, the cells still became larger and heavier. That is under plus two degrees Celsius. But you cannot say the same for dinoflagellates. That the warming significantly reduces the, the dry weight of the cells, indicating that the total energy content of the cell is likely to go down significantly. And other studies have shown that these changes are accompanied by changes at the molecular level of the cell, where the essential biochemical nutrients, like the essential fatty acids, the proteins, and the essential amino acids also get deteriorated because of the impact of temperature on the stability of this structure molecules. So, so then 
have a situation where the zoo plantain that feed on the phytoplankton is heavily impacted by the changes in our ocean environment. And what you see here is, is a model investigation that I carried out with when I was in Hamburg on the one on the Euro Ocean project. And what we see here is that the maximum growth rates of phytoplankton uh, of zooplankton actually is strongly coupled with the changes in both the temperature of the ocean and the nutrient quality or the nutrient content of the ocean. So this, the interaction between these effects have been shown by many studies to impact significantly, not only on the abundance of zooplankton that serve as food for fish, but also on the distribution of zooplankton. And observations from the North Sea, for example, show that the warming of the North Sea has caused a shift in the key composition of uh, the key copper pot composition within the North Sea environment, where you have a shift from the cold water species, mainly the Kalanois, uh, Fumakikos, to a warm water species, the Kalanonis, uh, the Kalanus hegoladicus. So you have a situation where the fit, the food environment of the of the fish is changing, and such changes are impacting or have been observed to impact strongly on the abundance of the Atlantic cod in the North Sea. So when you throw the effect of temperature and food conditions, and in food conditions together and investigate how these two are likely to impact upon the amount of fish that will be available for us to catch, a picture emerges. And the first that has been shown by many studies, including uh, colleagues working on the Sea Around Us uh, project, shows that we are likely to experience a polar shift in fish biomes, where the tropical areas of the world are likely to, to lose out if I can use that, that word, they are likely to experience about 40% drop in, in maximum fish catches. Whereas in the, at the higher latitude, the amount of fish is likely to go up. This is simple because at higher latitude areas, the organisms living there are used to the normal seasonal variations in temperature. So then it takes a bit more for them to react to changes in temperature than organisms that are living in the tropics where their adaptive uh, capacities are a bit limited. The second evolution that we are also likely to see is that the amount of fish that will be available also be moved downwards, so into deeper waters. So then it means that where we are likely to locate fish will, will be deeper than the normal experiences our fishermen encounter. The third is that we are likely, especially for the migratory species such as tuna that are able to move between different EEZs and across oceans, we are likely to experience a horizontal shift in, 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 in fish biome. And this has been shown to occur already in the Pacific Ocean, where we have eastward shift in the amount of different, uh, in the biomass of fish species. This has been seen in the skipjack tuna as well as in the big eye tuna. So we have a situation on our hands. The situation here is that fish biomasses are going to move northward and horizontally, and they are going to move into deeper waters. How do we then, in terms of management practices, handle such scenarios? Well, it may imply that 
our fishing effort must also migrate with the fish. If it happens that because of the climate, uh, the, the changes in our global climate, our fish stocks are going to move into different habitat, habitats that are more conducive for their growth, then our fishermen may be tempted to also follow this fish. This will have implications for the type of gear that are deployed, the techniques that are used, as well as even the, the time they spend at sea. So to, to summarize, the changes that are expected under climate change are, are that we are likely to have less of amount, less amount of fish, and this amount of fish will likely move upwards to high latitude areas where temperature conditions may be more conducive, and they may also move downwards where also temperature conditions may be more conducive. And on the horizontal scale, the fish may, may migrate along the same latitude, may migrate to different areas where uh, food conditions and temperature conditions may be ideal. So this is all that I wanted to share with you. I, I'm sure during the questions and answers time, we'll have more time to elaborate on the issue. I deliberately, uh, as I said earlier, decided not to mention the effects related to share fishes because we are all familiar with this effect. Thank you very much. Emmanuel, very many thanks for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, so stark, the, the rates of change that we see and the significance of those changes. So many, many thanks. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna take questions right now from Emmanuel. I'm gonna move to Danny Dizzy's talk, but please, if you do have questions, could you put them into the question and answer box and Emmanuel will be able to see those and reply to you by typing a message. And Senior has reminded us uh, that you're very welcome to get in touch with her at Strathclyde University at the One Ocean Hub office if you want to follow up on any issues after the webinar. So without further ado, I want to bring our, our last speaker of the day uh, to, to talk to us. So Danny, if you want to share your screen, Danny Diz is uh, based at the Lyle Centre in Edinburgh at Harriet Watt University. She will be talking to us uh, on the ocean climate nexus under international governance frameworks. Uh, Danny is an old friend of mine, and I'm really, really delighted to have her on the webinar today. She's now a bicentennial associate professor at the Lyle Center at Harriet Watts, just over the way in Edinburgh. She has over 20 years experience uh, in the field of environmental law and oceans governance. She's held positions with both governments and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and now clearly in academia. She participates regularly in uh, UN meetings related to the law of the sea, marine biodiversity and fisheries, and conducts policy and legal studies related to marine biodiversity conservation and sustainable use to UN agencies, government institutions and civil society. So Danny, absolute pleasure, the floor is yours. Thanks, Murray. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, thank everybody, and uh, I'll go straight for, in, in the interest of time, I'll go straight to my talk. What I wanted to talk to you today uh, is just to give a, a very quick and broad overview of some of the uh, international legal frameworks that are applicable to, to this ocean and climate nexus. So it's very high level um, and very brief. Uh, so first, I'd like to look into uh, some of the provisions under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that um, are applicable uh, to climate change or to the changes of the ocean and in, in the effects of climate change and ocean acidification. Then we'll look into the interface of that with uh, the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, and how oceans is portrayed in, in, in those agreements. Uh, finally, looking to the Convention on Biological Diversity, because it, uh, that convention offers some tools uh, and guidelines for us to, to address some of those issues, Li the links also with the Sustainable Development Goals and some conclusions. So just in terms of uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, 
um, as you, a lot of you know, you're, uh, a lot of you in the, in, the, in the seminar today are experts on the law of the sea convention. Uh, so it's, it's great to be talking to you about this. Uh, as you know, the definition of pollution is provided into, um, by its article one of the convention. And it's a very broad definition of pollution. So if we look into you know, the, 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 that definition, the effects of climate change and of ocean acidification could also be included, could be interpreted as being part of that definition of pollution. So that's just to, to get us uh, thinking about it. And then related to that definition of, of pollution, a very relevant part of the convention is part 12 of the convention. And part 12 is around the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Uh, it contains a number of obligations that are uh, very pertinent and very relevant to um, how on how to address um, climate change effects and ocean acidification as well. Um, for example, states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. Uh, they shall take individual or, or jointly appropriate measures to prevent, reduce, and control pollution. So if we think of that definition of pollution, uh, it, it's covered in there so that uh, from any source, any, any pollution from any source to the, to the marine environment. Um, and such measures should also include area-based management measures to, protect, to, to help adapt uh, to, the, the, to these more uh, harmful conditions that we're seeing at the moment and that have been highlighted throughout <clears throat> all these uh, previous presentations before me. Uh, other uh, relevant provisions that I think it's really good to keep in mind when thinking about the relationship between UNCLOS and climate change is the uh, provisions around uh, the obligation of states to conduct environmental impact assessments uh, which are contained in articles 204 and, two, and 206, and also the obligation to prevent, re reduce, and control pollution uh, of the marine environment from all those different sources, from land-based sources, uh, from seabed activity sources, from the areas, so the, the, the seabed in the, uh, of areas beyond national jurisdiction, and also from and through the atmosphere. So I think this is, a, you know, especially when we think of activities um, in the area, deep sea bed mining, for example, thinking of the, the talk that uh, Andrew Sweetman gave, it's a good, uh, you know, insight into that and also linking that to the obligations to conduct environmental impact assessments. And I think that one of the, the obligations that we can think of is how can we include uh, an obligation of um, assessing the impacts of certain activities could have to exacerbate uh, climate change and ocean acidification in the ocean. So thinking of those activities that could pose disturbance to blue carbon ecosystems, uh, including sediments, um, it, it's something to keep in mind. Then just briefly, uh, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the UN um, Framework Convention um, on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. And more specifically, um, I'd like to, oh, sorry, am I, am I still, can you still see my slides? We do, but no longer the slideshow. We see the presenter oh, view now. Okay, so let me go back. I think I pressed some strange Oops. button. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so even though the Paris Agreement, uh, we can only find reference to oceans uh, in the Paris Agreement in its preambular paragraph that's um, translated, it's contained there on the screen. Um, there are cross references between the Paris Agreement uh, in reference to Article 4 of the UNFCCC that specifically mentioned uh, the, the, the role of all um, uh, carbon sinks, including the oceans, including the oceans and marine biodiversity contained in the oceans for that matter. So it's important to keep that in mind that even though uh, we can, you know, sometimes uh, I see criticisms around while well, the Paris Agreement only addresses oceans in its preambular paragraph. I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that preambular paragraphs are also important tools to interpret the objectives of the convention and the objectives of the Paris Agreement, as we all know, is to reduce um, uh, CO uh, greenhouse gas emissions to, uh, to a point that it doesn't 
doesn't exceed two, de uh, exceed two degrees or uh, ideally 1.5 uh, degrees. But uh, in, in connecting that to the UNFCCC, where there is a cross-reference throughout the text of the Paris Agreement, especially with respect to Article 4 of the UNFCCC, we can see that oceans, uh, it is part of the mandate not to necessarily manage oceans, but to, um, to take that into account and to protect uh, those reservoirs, those sinks, those blue carbon ecosystems, I think we can interpret um, the Paris Agreement in a way that we can see that uh, blue carbon ecosystems should be incorporated into the uh, national, nationally determined um, contributions, the NDCs, for example, or the national um, adaptation plans, the NAPs, that Merle also referred to before. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Then uh, just briefly on the CBD, on the Convention on Biological Diversity, I think that there is also, a, because of that entry point that the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC um, gives us uh, that entry point with respect to the, the ecosystems that uh, provide those services in terms of carbon sinks, uh, we, we should look into the Convention on Biological Diversity as well as a tool and, and those synergies across all of those different conventions, I think it's really important to keep in mind. So um, the, the convention, uh, as you know, the objective of the convention is to conserve and sustainably manage uh, biodiversity, as well as uh, to provide an equitable uh, benefit sharing arising from um, uh, genetic resources utilization, but with respect to marine biodiversity specifically, um, the convention adopts uh, every two years when they meet uh, as a conference of the parties decisions on marine and coastal biodiversity. And, and there are a number of tools that have been adopted under that uh, decision that that can be very useful for us in terms of for states and, and, and also for, um, for any one of us to follow uh, with the means to reduce um, those impacts either through mitigation or adaptation. So one thing I wanted to, 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 to focus the attention now is for example, when in 2010, the Convention of Biological Diversity uh, Parties adopted the Aichi Biodiversity Targets and uh, as part of this biodiversity framework for um, uh, minimizing or reducing biodiversity loss uh, and, and with a view to live in harmony with nature, which is the vision to be achieved by 2050. One of the targets, one of those targets, uh, target 10, uh, which expired already in 2015, but of course the IHO targets uh, are expiring, on, uh, the, the package of IHO targets are expiring in 2020. So this year and a new set of targets are being agreed upon and negotiated to be adopted next year in uh, the 15th um, meeting of the Conference of the Parties uh, next year. So IHO biodiversity target 10 is really important I find because it, it talks about this um, commitment of states to address, uh, to minimize multiple anthropogenic pressures on coral reefs, but also on other vulnerable ecosystems impacted by climate change and ocean acidification, and to maintain, so as to maintain their integrity and functioning. It was only uh, later in 2014 that some guidance was developed with respect to um, how to attain, how to achieve those target, that target. It was really concerning, I think, to, to parties as well, that uh, in 2014, um, looking to the assessments of how much progress has been made to achieve that, that target, uh, it was concluded uh, under the Global Biodiversity uh, Outlook, uh, the fourth edition, it was concluded that uh, instead of going towards the achievement of that target, actually we're moving further away from achieving that target. And, and um, a priority actions to achieve uh, target 10 with respect to coral reefs and closely associated ecosystems was adopted by COP. Uh, for uh, COP12 in 2014 to see if that could help implement that target in a more, um, in a more effective manner. After this, 
we had um, uh, because there are also other ecosystems that are vulnerable to to ocean acidification and climate change, as Andrew uh, highlighted in his talk as well. Uh, cold water areas, so areas uh, where the depth is um, above 200 meters, were considered also a very uh, important ecosystems uh, to to be taken a look at uh, with respect to achieving IH biodiversity target 10. And, and Murray, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here with you because Murray was uh, critical in developing a study that, um, that fed into the adoption of that uh, voluntary specific work plan on biodiversity in cold, uh, in cold water areas. Originally, I, I find it an interesting story to tell that originally uh, the, um, the, the, the name of this, the title of this document was Voluntary Specific Work Plan on Biodiversity in Cold Water Areas, but one specific uh, contracting party to the convention um, didn't want it to be applied in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and after some negotiations, another party um, uh, came up with this, um, <laughs> with this um, addition within the jurisdiction of scope of the convention, which is kind of um, dubious because there is multiple interpretations of what the jurisdiction of scope of the convention is. Um, since it's in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the CBD is also applicable to activities and processes. So one might interpret that this voluntary specific plan can be um, also applied in areas beyond national jurisdictions while um, others might not agree. So it's just, uh, um, I find those uh, type of things quite amusing when I'm uh, in, those, in those meetings. So that's uh, a good um, negotiation skills there, <laughs> a lesson learned uh, for you. And, uh, and, and I think this is a very good plan that amongst many other, you know, it's a very comprehensive plan, but some of the things that um, the plan highlights as uh, important to, to, to undertake is to avoid and minimize and mitigate the impacts of global and local stressors, um, especially their cumulative effects, uh, and also to identify and protect refugia sites. Uh, Andrew also talked about those. And, and I wanted to also, when we're referring to avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating uh, the impacts of local stressors or global stressors or cumulative impacts, it's also important to note that uh, the CBG parties have also adopted a number of guidance regarding uh, impact assessments and strategic environmental assessments that are relevant to the application of that, uh, to the achievement of that target and to the achievement of some of the objectives of this work plan. Um, and, uh, and, and, and those guys, especially uh, the CBG biodiversity inclusive uh, guidelines contains specific reference to uh, the need to assess um, the impacts, the effects of, of climate change and ocean acidification when conducting impact assessments for, for any activities because uh, those stressors are um, accumulating in the oceans and we can't, you know, we can't uh, extract just, you know, one impact without considering the broader uh, seascape that you're talking about. So it's something that I wanted to highlight. Um, and so in contrast to that uh, target 10 that we had, and it's, a, it's a, of course, it expired in 2015, but uh, parties were still working towards achieving that. Uh, but the whole set of IH biodiversity targets, the, uh, uh, um, the 20 targets are about to expire, as I said. And this new post-2020 global biodiversity framework is being negotiated at the moment. So there is one specific target, target uh, draft, target seven, that talks about climate change. Uh, and you can see there on the screen, uh, the current language is by 2030, increased contributions to climate change mitigation, adaptation and disaster risk reduction from nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches, ensuring resilience and minimizing any negative impacts on biodiversity. 
What strikes me from that target so far is that it doesn't contain reference to ocean acidification as opposed to IH biodiversity target 10. Um, it does talk about the need to um, uh, implement nature-based solutions, but the CBG hasn't, um, hasn't adopted the definition of nature-based solutions yet. The IUCN has adopted a definition of nature-based solutions, and I think it would be very useful to either uh, under a CBG decision on biodiversity and climate that they, they also have uh, adopted uh, every two years, they could provide a definition or refer to the IUCN definition, but I think definitions are important and it, it should be contained in there. In terms of the application of ecosystem-based approaches, um, and, and also, um, well, the CBG has guidance on uh, ecosystem-based approach, ecosystem approach in general, and also guidance on uh, ecosystem-based adaptation that I'll, I'll refer to in a minute. And uh, in addition to that, so that's the, what's being negotiated at the moment. So everything is, you know, uh, open uh, so far. And I think I'm running out of time, but I'm almost wrapping up, <laughs> Murray. So I uh, just wanted to, to also um, remind ourselves that there, in terms of ocean acidification, there is specific targets still, um, you know, uh, contained in the um, um, Sustainable Development Goals 14.3. Uh, uh, which talks about the need to minimize and address impacts of ocean acidification. Uh, and the indicator is the average, uh, the pH uh, that we heard from Andrew as well. Um, I think it would be, you know, it, it, but in, even though it talks about uh, that the pH as an indicator, it doesn't contain a specific threshold for what would be the safe levels, if, if any, <laughs> uh, above what, you know, uh, what we, we, we have at the moment. We know that the oceans are more acidic, about 30% more acidic than pre-industrial levels. Um, it, this is probably already not safe, but I think that in terms of indicators, it would be um, something that would be helpful. Since we have a temperature target under the Paris Agreement, it would be helpful to perhaps have uh, a threshold um, for ocean acidification as well. Um, just quickly, in terms of ecosystem-based adaptation, that's another tool that was adopted, uh, guidelines adopted under the CBG in 2018, that would, could serve as a, as a very useful uh, tool to be, to be applied. And it also, it's, it's a good guidance that also refers to a lot of the things that uh, Merle was talking about, the need to, um, to involve uh, indigenous peoples and local communities into the decision-making and, and, and consider their uh, knowledge as well in, in developing those plans. And I think this is something that should be linked to the national adaptation plans as we already uh, noted. So just to conclude, um, um, I, you know, the need, uh, there is a need to protect and minimize cumulative anthropogenic impacts on, on blue carbon ecosystems because they, not only for climate uh, purposes, but also because of the stack benefit uh, services that they provide uh, for people's well being as well. Um, a need, but I, I think there is a need for a standardization of metrics and indicators because between those you know, different conventions, there's, um, you know, it, it's not helpful to have uh, apples and oranges, uh, as you will. Uh, carbon accounting methods of blue carbon ecosystems, uh, I think, should be expanded beyond. Um, so uh, currently, um, under the IPCC, has guidance for carbon accounting uh, that includes, in terms of marine environments or coastal environments, it includes methodologies for salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. And it would be really beneficial, I think, to expand uh, those methodologies for standardized uh, reporting and, and NDCs and all of that to other uh, blue carbon ecosystems as well, including those of the uh, deep water ecosystems um, and sediments because they provide. So there is good examples in Scotland already methodologies used for that that could be um, built upon. Uh, also defining ecologically safe thresholds for pH, as, as I said, um, there has been work done under the um, planetary boundaries framework around aragonite saturation boundaries, but, but pH, uh, it, it, there hasn't been any under the policy, international policy context at least. Um, and, and finally, it's just the need to strengthen mechanisms for um, 
for cooperation across conventions and processes so we can benefit from, um, from the synergies across those different processes, but without uh, taking, you know, without undermining their mandates, but at the same time strengthening um, those, um, those processes. So uh, that's it for me now. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Danny. That, that, that was wonderful. So um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to move straight to our intervention. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to pass the microphone to Mr. Hendra Siri from the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. So, okay. Mr. Siri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, the screen is mine right now. So. Right. Thank you, Marie. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the wonderful presentation from Andrew to Marley. And also to Daniel, that's really, uh, really endangered uh, us to, you know, to understand that the impact of the climate change, uh, not only from um, the other perspective, but also from, from I think it can be ranged from the Arctic um, uh, or the, uh, the deep sea uh, into the uh, right now how uh, in, uh, the the impact to the the pelagic as well the community uh, level. Uh, <clears throat> for Andrew, I think it's a. Uh, uh, I would like to know, uh, you know, if if uh, later on that we can uh, make sure that how we can link uh, the impact of the Arctic to the uh, the tropical seas, it will be more. Uh, I know, uh, for me, uh, my perspective, I think it will be will be uh, give more impact to the that's uh, the anthropogenic impact that will be, uh, you know, give the substantial changes into the Arctic seas and an impact to the tropical seas as well. And uh, for Malena, uh, I enjoyed the presentation because it is like uh, the same um, uh, what we also have in Indonesia for the community-based adaptation. Uh, we we apply what we what we say that um, uh, <clears throat> from community for community and by community. So I think it's, this is one of tool that we try to expand that uh, all the development program, uh, including how to the mitigations for uh, for the this uh, the, the disaster. As well for the climate change adaptation, by uh, empower them to uh, to plan and to assess their strength and their weeks, and then can be later on can be prioritized uh, for for the next uh, uh, interventions. Then for uh, uh, Emmanuel, I think it is really uh, understand that it's a it's similar to Indonesia as well. It's a, for the pelagic, this is a complexity there, and then. Uh, I think is uh, the evolution from uh, the pelagic. Uh, it's uh, really give more uh, substantial information related for the what the impacts in terms of the management uh, implication. And uh, for Daniel, I think is a, is one of uh, I think is really uh, <clears throat> uh, good uh, presentation in terms of uh, how you know in terms of the uh, uh, the global. Architecture for uh, oceans uh, related to in terms of the application. I think one of what we can see that um, uh, the I think is one of uh, the progress uh, because in last uh, uh, COP uh, 25 we have uh, the mandate for dialogue to open the ocean and climate change, and then this thing is already uh, open for a country, and then current COP is. Uh, uh, conducted that. I think it's um, the way since I follow the ocean dimension into the climate change since 2009, uh, try to involve that in terms of, you know, uh, the Copenhagen uh, Accord, uh, the substance of the ocean. So it's uh, things that, that we learn that it's difficult. But uh, I think um, we can refer how the forests, you know, uh, can uh, make sure that they, they uh, explicitly, uh, explicitly appear in the uh, in the what do you call this, in the decision process and in the decision and it takes like more than a decade but we can shorten the, the, the process by you know we address the the missing point that we need to strengthen ocean and make sure the ocean can be reflected into the uh, climate change uh, negotiation process as well its decision and I think so one we learned from the Daniel presentation is like uh, we can say that it can be. Uh, I was also advised by my friends that it's, we can see that how the scatter uh, the UN uh, body to address the uh, oceans uh, is not in, in 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 my friends' term is not integrated enough to do it. 
So the question is, can we, do we need to establish a kind of like a UN ocean? And if we need it, how, uh, how urgency it is to, 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 to establish that? Or do we need to a kind of existing modalities can be strengthened? And what kind of uh, modalities we can, we can bring to make sure that uh, the ocean can be addressed in, in, in integrated manners uh, and also in, the, in a very comprehensive manner. I think this is Emory. Um, that's uh, uh, my intervention and for the very nice uh, presentation. And it is like, um, you know, improve my knowledge and perspective. Thank you very much for the presentation. And also thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be part of this important uh, 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 webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, that was wonderful. We are slightly over time, as everyone knows, but I think we should see if anyone on the panel would like to quickly reply or come back on any of the points. If not, I will begin to wrap this webinar up. So panelists, do think if you want to come back on any points. I've got really just two points, which I think could wrap our afternoon together uh, from the, the European time zone at any rate. Um, the One Ocean Hub, if it has anything at its heart, it has people at its heart and it has a transdisciplinary approach at its heart. And what really makes me feel much more positive when I hear the terrible news of what climate change will do, I mean, this is going to happen. We now see a much greater coming together across all of our disciplines and across all of the sectors that need to come together around these issues. I think from that, we should take great heart. Also picking up very quickly on Emmanuel's presentation, the polewood migration of fish, we're seeing that already. I mean, it's so clear. Projections that were made in, in a North Atlantic project over the last five years, the Atlas project, suggested that a certain species, Halicolinus dactylopterus, that's the black belly rosefish, would have started to occur off Iceland, or its numbers would increase off Iceland. Well, Icelandic fishermen have told us that's happening already. We thought it would be in decades. So things are going to change. Conditions are going to become more challenging in some places. And it's the poorest communities in the world that are feeling this first. And that's why that coming together is so important. And I think these international projects are so vital. So it's been a great honor to be with you this, today. Uh, many, many thanks to the panelists for your wonderful presentations. Uh, the video will be circulated soon, the link to watch this. So thank you all very, very much. And we'll draw this webinar to a close. Thank you.